commitment by President Trump to provide security guarantees to North Korea. A reparation of American POW and MIA remains, and crucially, North Korea's commitment to, quote, work toward complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, though there is no mention of verification or even a definition of what that phrase means to each side. President, as we said, about to be asked about all this in the room for the president's uh, news conference, our chief White House correspondent, Hallie Jackson. Uh, and joining me here is uh, chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell, and national correspondent, Peter Alexander. Hallie, let me go to you uh, first. The president held up this document at the signing but didn't explain what it is. Are there, at a casual look, are there any commitments that Kim Jong-un made specifically? Warm relations, a new chapter in U.S. Well, North he Korean says complete denuclearization, Lester, in exchange for what the U.S. has described as security assurances. But there are still US some real foreign, questions here. You listed some of them. What specifically are those security assurances that the U.S. is prepared to offer North Korea when it comes to denuclearization? What is the timeline? We know that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who is just seated behind me here in the room, is going to be picking up the ball and moving forward on these talks. But when the president talks about this happening very soon, what does that actually mean? Me. Chief of Staff John Kelly, by the way, just to give you some color in here, has just sat down as well, which means we expect the president any minute, Lester. And there are some real questions for him. You also look at the optics of this. This obviously was an historic moment, the sitting U.S. president meeting with the leader of North Korea. But remember, amid the smiles, amid the body language there, the backpats, the greetings, the handshakes, this is a leader who has been accused of some of the worst human rights abuses in the world. That was not uh, a topic of discussion to our understanding around the table today, Lester, but I do believe the president will address that when he comes out on the stage just moments from now. Thank you. And maybe the bigger question right now as we await the president uh, that we all have to ask ourselves is, do we feel any safer that these two have met? Andrea Mitchell, you have read through this document. Um, should people, should we feel better about the world? I suppose we should feel better that these two men have met and are committed to a new relationship. But there is nothing specific in here. There's no timeline for future meetings. There's no definition of denuclearization. There's nothing about verification. There's no commitment as to what the security guarantees would be. So we don't know whether the president, in talking about security guarantees, discussed someday removing troops, 28,000 American troops in South Korea, right below the DMZ and a number of bases. Did he talk about changing the nuclear umbrella over our allies? It's remarkably thin. And compared to past arms agreements and complicated negotiations, it seems more like, uh, like an extended photo opportunity with a lot of drama and a lot of personal diplomacy that could lead some, somewhere down the road. But there's not even a schedule for the next meeting. And, and Peter, the, the, the president did sell this, though, as, uh, as I don't think he used the word breakthrough, but he certainly sold it in a fashion like they had accomplished a lot here. Yeah, that's right. He said it's very comprehensive, as Andrew just sort of laid out. There are no new commitments there. There is no new timetable. But what it is is certainly a new start, and that's what the president is going to say. He said he, this is a man who sort of envisioned a new effort, a new way of reimagining this relationship between the two countries, and that's what he's going to sell. Even though it's not some big deal, he'll insist that is the start of a deal. He said, as we spoke to him at the White House in recent weeks, I really think he wants to denuke, he said of Kim Jong-un. And now the devil is in the details. Can they hold Kim Jong-un accountable? Will they be able to make this complete and verifiable, irreversible denuclearization, not just the more sort of vague language that we see here. We have seen language much tougher in the past, going back to 1994, the first real agreement of this kind. This doesn't get to that level. The question will be, can they deliver something on par with those efforts in the past? Our Richard Engel is in Seoul, South Korea, where they are, of course, watching all this uh, quite keenly because uh, they are profoundly affected by what happens here. Uh, Richard, you've spent a lot of time in South Korea trying to understand these tensions and what it would take to make people there feel safer. What are your thoughts? Well, I think this, this 
this document, we, we've seen the text by now, it is so vague as to almost be meaningless. It is a declaration of principles in which uh, the two sides, President Trump and Kim Jong-un, agree to work for better relations on the uh, Korean Peninsula, that uh, North Korea works to uh, denuclearize, although that's never sp exactly spelled out what that is. There's no time frame. There's no enforcement mechanism. So uh, it looks like President Trump spent a great deal uh, to get this very vague agreement. He came to Asia. He put his own credibility. He put the United States credibility on the line, spent American political capital in order to get this unenforceable commitment. Where I am in, in South Korea, the South Korean government is going to be very pleased by this. Uh, while President Trump is going to spin himself as a winner because he got some piece of paper out of it and he got this photo op, uh, I think here the South Korean government is going to say, look, it brought the two sides together. Six months ago, President Trump was lobbing insults at the uh, North Korean leader and North Korea was firing rockets. Now they've at least agreed on some sort of principles. So. The South Korean government can say it did deliver on its promise. It did broker a peace agreement. And finally, clearly, the big winner here is Kim Jong-un. Uh, he only committed to something that he has already committed to in the past. He's already said he would denuclearize. He wrote his name down on a piece of paper that said he would somehow do that with no time frame given. And in exchange, he got a full meeting with the president of the United States on the podium in Asia in front of the world's camera. He was elevated to an accepted world leader and all he had to do was sign his name to an unenforceable declaration of principles. I, I, Richard, I, I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, all the sanctions against the Kim Jong-un regime are still in place and there's nothing here that suggests that they're going to be lifted. So does that still put the, the, the weight in favor of the U.S. in this, that at some point he is going to have to, to, to move the dial in order to get some relief? This is, and one would hope, that this is the starting point. And the document even describes that this is a starting point and that they will continue to be a process of dialogue. And yes, the United States does have that stick. The United States still has the sanctions. There's no uh, no mention that the U.S. will uh, immediately lift the sanction. There's really no mention of any specifics at all. But what Kim Jong-un got from this is recognition. He can now go home and show his people that he is an accepted international leader on the world stage and he has a document to prove that the United States is committing also in vague terms to having better relations. So he can go home and tell him that he is now uh, tell his people that he has now been elevated to a legitimate leader uh, as opposed to someone who is always called a dictator, the leader of a rogue state. He can now uh, say, I was on the same platform as the president of the United States, the man often described as the leader of the free world, who said it was an honor to meet me. And all I had to do was sign a piece of paper that said what I've already said, that I would commit to denuclearization somehow, somewhere, over some time period that is not defined. All right. And Richard, right now we are waiting for the president to emerge and, and begin the news conference. They're showing some kind of a video right now in that news conference room. But as soon as he takes the podium, uh, uh, we will uh, we will hear what the president said. Let me go back to Andrea, though, on that same point we're, we're speaking of. Sanctions aren't mentioned here. And that continues to be the leverage and, and maybe ultimately what drove Kim Jong-un to come to Singapore and sit down here. So does that... Does that still leave the, the, the favor toward the United States to, to get well, something done? There's a lot of clout there, but China will have the leverage above all. Uh, Mike Pompeo is leaving for Seoul tomorrow and then to Beijing the day after. He's already called the Japanese and the, Korea, the South Koreans to brief them on the outcome of this. Uh, I'm sure that the South Koreans, as Richard is reporting, are very happy with it because President Moon of South Korea was pushing this. but. Uh, it really depends on whether China and Russia are willing to keep the pressure on. And had the president having shown that he wants uh, some sort of accord with Kim Jong-un, it's very hard now to say that this is a dictator who deserves to be sanctioned when he's been praised so lavishly, effusively by the president of the United States in this kind of setting. 
it's going to be hard to keep the sanctions pressure up. Uh, Peter, the president uh, kind of telegraphed the probably the, the political arguments to come, yeah. noting that even his critics will be surprised at how well he did here, in his in his opinion. And are we going to see a position here where the president is going to be criticized? Uh, for a lack of specifics in this document. I think already you're hearing that criticism. Certainly this is the president who just shredded the Iran nuclear deal, a deal that did have a step-by-step -step process to try to verify the denuclearization of Iran, their inability to build nuclear weapons. Here, obviously, the best agreement he got is this very vague statement. What sort of strikes me as we get ready, the president will be leaving Singapore in a matter of hours from now is in many ways this can be viewed as a, a coming out party as observers are describing it for Kim Jong-un. Literally we saw him last night as his motorcade was driving through the street sort of reveling in the adulation of the Singaporean people on the world stage today. He stood side by side with the American president. When all is said and done in many ways this is the day that the world in effect courtesy Donald Trump validated Kim Jong-un and history ultimately will judge whether that was the right move to make. You mentioned the motorcade and, and something we didn't note earlier. Uh, at one point there was an odd moment. We see the two of them walk out. There is what is effectively known as the beast, right. the, the presidential uh, uh, limousine and it appeared the president was showing it off. Yeah, that, that was a that was a re remarkable. You know, yeah. he literally opened the door in, and we see that occasionally from a distance. The doors are thick. This is a man, Kim Jong Un, who has his own security precautions. You know, he brought his own food, even brought his own toilet here to Singapore. And on his uh, ride yesterday in his motorcade in his own limousine, he has those strapping young men that run alongside of him, each of whom was handpicked for their martial arts skills, uh, even their looks. And the president got a look at. The way America does security, and I, uh, excuse me, Kim Jong Un did. I'm, I'm guessing he was probably pretty impressed by what he saw. All right, we're going to take you into the uh, into the news conference room there at the Capella Hotel, uh, where the uh, meeting between the two occurred. President Trump now entering the room. The applause, we presume, from his uh, well, the American much, delegation gathered there. Appreciate it. Of course, we're getting ready to go here back. Well. Here's the president. Had a tremendous. Uh, 24 hours. We've had a tremendous three months, actually, because this has been going on for quite a while. Uh, that was a tape that we gave to Chairman Kim and his uh, people, his representatives, and uh, it captures a lot, captures what could be done. And that's a great, a great place, has the potential to be an incredible place between South Korea, if you think about it, and China. That's uh, got tremendous potential, and I think he understands that, and he wants to do what's right. Uh, it's my honor today to address the people of the world following this very historic summit with Chairman Kim Jong-un of North Korea. We spent very intensive hours together, and I think most of you have gotten the signed document, or you will very shortly. It's very comprehensive. It's going to happen. I stand before you as an emissary of the American people to deliver a message of hope and vision and a message of peace. Let me begin by thanking our incredible hosts in Singapore, especially Prime Minister Lee, friend of mine. This is a country of profound grace and beauty, and we send our warmest wishes to every citizen of Singapore who really made this visit so important and so pleasant, despite all of the work and all of the long hours. I also want to thank President Moon of South Korea. He's working hard. In fact, I'll be speaking to him right after we're finished. Prime Minister Abe of Japan, friend of mine, just left our country. And he wants what's right for Japan and for the world. He's a good man and a very special person, President Xi of China, who has really closed up that border, maybe a little bit less so over the last couple of months, but that's okay. But he really has, and he's a terrific person and a friend of mine and a, uh, really a great leader of his people. I want to thank them for their efforts to help us get to this very historic day. Most importantly, I want to thank Chairman Kim for taking the first bold step toward a bright new future for his people. Our unprecedented meeting, the first between an American president and a leader of North Korea, proves that real change is indeed possible. 
My meeting with Chairman Kim was honest, direct, and productive. We got to know each other well in a very confined period of time under very strong, strong circumstance. We're prepared to start a new history, and we're ready to write a new chapter between our nations. Nearly 70 years ago, think of that, 70 years ago, an extremely bloody conflict ravaged the Korean Peninsula. Countless people died in the conflict, including tens of thousands of brave Americans. Yet while the armistice was agreed to, the war never ended to this day, never ended. But now we can all have hope that it will soon end, and it will, it will soon end. The past does not have to define the future. Yesterday's conflict does not have to be tomorrow's war. And as history has proven over and over again, adversaries can indeed become friends. We can honor the sacrifice of our forefathers by replacing the horrors of battle with the blessings of peace. And that's what we're doing, and that's what we have done. There is no limit to what North Korea can achieve when it gives up its nuclear weapons and embraces commerce and engagement with the rest of the world that really wants to engage. Chairman Kim has before him an opportunity like no other to be remembered as the leader who ushered in a glorious new era of security and prosperity for his people. Chairman Kim and I just signed a joint statement in which he reaffirmed his unwavering commitment to complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We also agreed to vigorous negotiations to implement the agreement as soon as possible. And he wants to do that. This isn't the past. This isn't another administration that never got it started and therefore never got it done. Chairman Kim has told me that North Korea is already destroying a major missile engine testing site. That's not in your signed document. We agreed to that after the agreement was signed. That's a big thing for the missiles that they were testing. The site is going to be destroyed very soon. Today is the beginning of an arduous process. Our eyes are wide open, but peace is always worth the effort, especially in this case. This should have been done years ago. They should have been resolved a long time ago. But we're resolving it now. Chairman Kim has the chance to seize an incredible future for his people. Anyone can make war, but only the most courageous can make peace. The current state of affairs cannot endure forever. The people of Korea, North and South, are profoundly talented, industrious, and gifted. These are truly gifted people. They share the same heritage, language, customs, culture, and destiny. But to realize their amazing destiny, to reunite their national family, the menace of nuclear weapons will now be removed. In the meantime, the sanctions will remain in effect. We dream of a future where all Koreans can live together in harmony, where families are reunited and hopes are reborn, and where the light of peace chases away the darkness of war. This bright future is within, and this is what's happening. It is right there. It's within our reach. It's going to be there. It's going to happen. People thought this could never take place. It is now taking place. It's a very great day. It's a very great moment in the history of the world. And Chairman Kim, He's on his way back to North Korea, and I know for a fact, as soon as he arrives, he's going to start a process that's going to make a lot of people very happy and very safe. So it's an honor to be with everybody today. The media, it's a big gathering of media, I will say. Makes me feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> but it is what it is. People understand that this is something very important to all of us, including yourselves and your family. So thank you very much for being here. We'll take some questions. Wow. That's a lot of questions. Go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. NBC.
Thanks, Mr. President. Two questions for you, if you don't mind. First, the man you met today, Kim Jong-un, as you know, has killed family members, has starved his own people, is responsible for the death of Otto Warmbier. Why are you so comfortable calling him very talented? Well, he is very talented. Anybody that takes over a situation like he did at 26 years of age and is able to run it and run it tough, I don't say he was nice or I don't say anything about it. He ran it. Very few people at that age, you can take one out of 10,000 probably couldn't do it. Otto Warmbier is a very special person and he will be for a long time in my life. His parents are good friends of mine. I think without Otto, this would not have happened. Something happened from that day. It was a terrible thing. It was brutal. But a lot of people started to focus on what was going on, including North Korea. I really think that Otto is someone who did not die in vain. I told this to his parents. Special young man. And, and I have to say, special parents, special people. Otto did not die in vain. He had a lot to do with us being here today. Okay? Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much. President, that second question for you, sir, was on the security. The second question, sir, on the security assurances you talked about in your statement. Can you be specific about what assurances you are willing to give to Kim Jong Un? Does that include reducing military capabilities? And just to follow no. up on your answer, no, you we're not that? reducing anything. We're not reducing. At some point, I have to be honest, and I used to say this during my campaign, as you know probably better than most. Uh, I want to get our soldiers out. I want to bring our soldiers back home. We have right now 32,000 soldiers in South Korea. And I'd like to be able to bring them back home, but that's not part of the equation right now. At some point, I hope it will be, but not right now. We will be stopping the war games, which will save us a tremendous amount of money, unless and until we see that the future negotiation is not going along like it should. But we'll be saving a tremendous amount of money. Plus, I think it's very provocative. Uh, yes, John? Yes, John, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought you were John Roberts. I looked at you. You looked right. just much better, we're right? Frequently, we're frequently confused, Mr. President. Yes. Mr. President, the joint statement does not talk about verifiable or irreversible denuclearization. Yeah. Is that a concession on the part of the United States? No, not at all, because if you look at it, I mean, it said we are going to, um, let's say here, it will be gone. We, I don't think you can be any more plain than what we're, what we're asking, issues related to the establishment of the new U.S. DPKR relations, the building. Uh, we talk about the uh, guarantees, and we talk about unwavering commitment to the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. This is the document that we just signed. Did you discuss with Chairman Kim methods to verify, either with the United States or international organizations, that very process? And do you yes, have we did. Yes, we mind? did. And Can we'll be verifying. That to us? Yeah, we'll be verifying. It'll be How verified. How is that going to be achieved, Mr. President? Well, it's going to be achieved by having a lot of people there. And as we develop a certain trust, and we think we have done that, uh, Secretary Pompeo has been really doing a fantastic job, his staff, everybody. As we do that, we're going to have a lot of people there, and we're going to be working with them on a lot of other things. But this is complete denuclearization of North will Korea, those and it will be verified. Will those people be Americans or international? Uh, a combinations of both. Agency people. Combinations of both. And we have talked about it, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Be nice. Be respectful. I'll be very respectful, sir. Uh, what, what did Kim Jong-un say to you to give you the confidence uh, that uh, for once in the history of North Korea, they are not cheating the system and gaming the world and, and gaming uh, the people who will have to go in and make sure that they're actually giving up their nuclear arsenal? Yeah, I mean, very fair what, question. What we, he actually mentioned the fact that they proceeded down a path in the past and ultimately, as you know, nothing got done. In one case, they took billions of dollars during the Clinton regime, took billions of dollars and nothing happened. That was a terrible thing. And he actually brought it up to me. And he said, we have never gone this far. I don't think they've ever had the confidence, frankly, in a president that they have right now for getting things done and having the ability to get things done. And 
he was very firm in the fact that he wants to do this. I think he might want to do this as much or even more than me, because they see a very bright future for North Korea. So you never know, right? We never know. But I'll tell you what, we signed a very comprehensive document today. And I think most of you have been given that document. But we signed a very, very comprehensive uh, document. And I believe he's going to live up to that document. In fact, when he lands, which is going to be shortly, I think that he will start that process right away. I do. I do. I can only say that I know him for really well. It's been very rhetorical, as you know. I think without the rhetoric, it wouldn't have happened. I think without other things going along, I think uh, the establishment of a new team was very important. They have a great team. But I do. I think he wants to get it done. I really feel that very strongly. Oh, there's John. I think, you know, you two guys look alike when the light is right on the... The hair is very similar. Let me see who has better hair. It's the, it's the He's got pretty good hair, John. I hate it's, the, uh, it's the angelic glow of the backlighting, Mr. President, that makes us look so similar. Um, of course, you, the denuclearization and nuclear weapons and biological weapons and whatnot is one problem in North Korea. Another huge problem is the, the horrible record that they have on human rights. Was that discussed at yes. all? Is that something that you will tackle in the yes, future? Yes, it was discussed. Um, it will be discussed future, human rights. And what was also discussed in great detail, John, was the fact that, you know, we have, and I must have had I, I just countless calls and letters and tweets, anything you can do. They want the remains of their sons back. They want the remains of their fathers and mothers and all of the people that got caught into that really brutal war, which took place to a large extent in North Korea. And uh, I asked for it today, and we got it. That was a very last minute. Uh, the remains will be coming back. They're going to start that process immediately. But so many people, even during the campaign, they say, is there any way you can work with North Korea to get the remains of my son back or my father back? So many people asked me this question, and, you know, I said, look, we don't get along too well with that particular group of people. But now we do. And he agreed to that so quickly and so nice. It was really a very nice thing. And he understands it. He understands it. So um, for the thousands and thousands, I guess way over 6,000 that we know of in terms of the remains, uh, they'll be brought back. The, the POW MIA issue clearly is a very important one for thousands. It's especially to a lot of people that but, are. But what, what do you, President Trump, expect Kim Jong-un to do about the human rights record regarding the North Korean people? Right. Uh, it was discussed. It was discussed relatively briefly compared to denuclearization. Well, obviously, that's where we started and where we ended. But uh, they will be doing things. And uh, I think he wants to do things. I think he wants to. You'd be very surprised. A very smart, very good negotiator. Wants to do the right thing. You know, he brought up the fact that in the past, they took dialogue far. They never went, they never were like we are. There's never been anything like what's taken place now. But they went down the line. Billions of dollars was gi were given, and, you know, the following day, the nuclear program continued. But this is a much different time, and this is a much different president, in all fairness. This is very important to me. This was one of the, perhaps, one of the reasons that I won. I campaigned on this issue, as you know very well, John. Okay, uh, whoever those people are, I can I cannot see you with all the lights, but you don't look like either of the two. Yeah, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President, and first of all, congratulations. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, did you uh, touch on the issue of uh, uh, peace treaty, and also no. uh, will you travel to Pyongyang anytime soon? Well, at a certain time, I will. I said that will be a day that I look very much forward to at the appropriate time. And I also will be inviting Chairman Kim at the appropriate time to the White House. I would, I think it's, it's really going to be something that will be very important. And he has accepted. I said at the appropriate time. We want to go a little bit further down the road. But what we signed today was uh, a lot of things included. And then you have things that weren't included that we got after the deal was signed. I've done that before in my life. And we didn't put it in the agreement because we didn't have time. 
And I think most of you have been handed out the agreement or soon will, but uh, I, oh, you have not? Okay, well, if you could have those agreements passed out. We just finished them just a little while ago. Uh, but if you could have the agreements passed out, well, you'll see what we're talking about. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, I want to second the congr congratulations, President. Um, Thank you. Uh, what part did Japan play, and did the abduction issue come up? And yes. Also, the fate of uh, uh, the Christians. And the yes. follow-up question is, uh, when will you be doing an interview with Japanese TV? Fifty thousand American troops are in Japan. That's true. Again, fifty thousand great troops. That's true. Yeah, it did abduction. Absolutely. This Prime Minister Abe is uh, one of his certainly, other than. The whole denuking subject, uh, certainly his, I would say, his main point. And I brought it up, absolutely. And they're going to be working on that. It will be. We didn't put it down in the document, but it will be worked on. Uh, Christians, yes, uh, we are brought it up very strongly. You know, Franklin Graham spent, spent and spends a tremendous amount of time in North Korea. He's got it very close to his heart. Uh, it did come up, and things will be happening. Okay? Thank you. Great question. Yes, John, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank uh, you, John. Uh, re returning to the question of human rights, you spoke very powerfully on the issue uh, during your State of the Union address. You, right. you showed that you had the defector in the First Lady's box with the crutches uh, who escaped. And you, at that point, said that North Korea uh, has more brutally oppressed its people than any other regime on earth. Do you still believe that is the case, having, having sat down with Kim Jong-un? And does he right. need to change that? John, I believe it's a rough situation over there. There's no question about it. And uh, we did discuss it today pretty strongly. I mean, knowing what the main purpose of what we were doing is, denuking, but uh, discussed it in, at pretty good length. Uh, we'll be doing something on it. It's, it's rough. It's rough in a lot of places, by the way. Not just there, but it's rough. And we will uh, continue that, and I think ultimately we'll agree to something. But uh, it was discussed at length outside of, outside of the nuclear situation, one of the primary topics. But okay. do you think that needs to change to bring on this glorious new era you've talked about? Are they going to have to? I think it will change, yeah. I think it probably has to, but I think it will. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Steve, that's you, Steve, right there? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, what timetable do you envision for their denuclearization? And in the meantime, you, are you thinking about easing any sanctions? Well, you know, scientifically, I've been watching and reading a lot about this, and it does take a long time to, you know, pull off complete denuclearization. It takes a long time. Scientifically, uh, you have to wait certain periods of time, and a lot of things happen. But despite that, once you start the process, it means it's pretty much over. You can't use them. That's the good news. And that's going to start very, very soon. I believe that's going to start very soon. Uh, we will do it as fast as it can mechanically and physically be done, Steve. And the sanctions? Uh, the sanctions will come off when we are sure that the nukes are no longer a factor. Sanctions played a big role. But they'll come off at that point. I hope it's going to be soon, but they'll come off. They, as you know, and as I've said, uh, the sanctions right now remain. But at a certain point, I actually look forward to taking them off. And they'll come off when we, we know we're down the road where it's not going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. Okay? Thank you. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Congratulations on this historic summit. Thank you very much. You Congratulations to everybody, by the way. <laughs> Congratulations to everybody. You, Go ahead. you signed a document with Kim Jong-un. Uh, it's essentially a piece of paper. Yesterday, we had a briefing from the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and he said the following. Many presidents previously have signed off of pieces of paper, only to find that the North Koreans either didn't promise what we thought they had or actually reneged on those promises. What makes this time different, Mr. President? Well, you have a different administration. You have a different president. You have a different Secretary of State. You have people that are, you know, it's very important to them. And we get it done. The other groups, maybe it wasn't a priority. I don't think they could have done it if it was a priority, frankly. I don't think they honestly could have done it even if it was a priority. And it would have been easier back then. Would have been, for me, it would have been much easier if this were 10 years ago or five years ago. And I'm not just blaming President Obama. I mean, this goes back for 25 years. This should have happened. 
I was given a very tough hand. I was given this, I was given the Iran deal, and plenty of other problems. But we are, um, we're doing really well. And the Iran deal, I have to be honest, we, I did it because nuclear is always number one to me. Nuclear is number one. But on the Iran deal, I think Iran is a different country now than it was three or four months ago. I don't think they're looking so much to the Mediterranean. I don't think they're looking so much at Syria like they were with total confidence. I don't think they're so confident right now. But I hope, with that being said, I hope that at the appropriate time, after these sanctions kick in, and they are brutal, what we've put on Iran, I hope that they're going to come back and negotiate a real deal, because I'd love to be able to do that. But right now, it's too soon for that. Yes, Mr. Please. President, you also did uh, talk about establishing diplomatic relations, yeah. uh, change, uh, exchanging ambassadors. How long before that happens? Uh, good question. Uh, hopefully soon, but we'll have to get things moving first. Very a little bit early for that. We have to get things moving. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Can you clarify when you said you're stopping war games? So yeah. if you are stopping the military exercises with, with South Korea? Yeah, we've done exercises yourself? for a long period of time working with South Korea. And uh, we call them war games, and I call them war games, and they're tremendously expensive. The amount of money that we spend on that is incredible. And South Korea contributes, but not 100 percent, which is certainly a subject that we have to talk to them about also. And that has to do with the military expense and also the trade. So uh, we're doing that. We actually have a new deal with South Korea in terms of the trade deal. But we have to talk to them. We have to talk to many countries about treating us fairly. But the war games are very expensive. We pay for a big majority of them. We fly in bombers from Guam. I said it when I first started. I said, where do the bombers come from? Guam, nearby. I said, oh, great, nearby. Where's nearby? Six and a half hours. Six and a half hours, that's a long time for these big, massive planes to be flying to South Korea to practice and then drop bombs all over the place and then go back to Guam. I know a lot about airplanes. It's very expensive. So and and I didn't like it. And what I, what I did say is, and I think it's very provocative. I have to tell you, Jennifer, it's a very provocative uh, situation. When, when I see that and you have a country right next door, so under the circumstances that we're negotiating a very comprehensive, complete deal, I think it's inappropriate to be having war games. So number one, we save money a lot. And number two, uh, it really is something that I think they very much appreciated. Does North Korea give you something in return, though? Well, we've gotten, you know, I've, I've heard that. I mean, some of the, the people that, uh, I don't know, maybe they really mean it. I don't, I don't always want to go against the press, because I just don't especially not today. This is too important. But I noticed that some of the people were saying that uh, the president has agreed to meet. He has given up so much. I gave up nothing. I'm here. I haven't slept in 25 hours, but I thought it was appropriate to do, because we've been negotiating for literally round the clock with them and with us and with John and with Mike and a whole team of very talented people. But we haven't given up anything other than you're right. I agreed to meet. And I think the meeting was every bit as good for the United States as it was for North Korea. But I, I just wrote down some of the things we got. And they, you know, they sure, they got a meeting. But only a person that dislikes Donald Trump would say that I've agreed to make a big commitment. Sure, I've, I've agreed to take a period of time and come here and meet, and that's good. But I think it's great for us and I, as a country, and I think it's good for them. But what did they do to justify this meeting? Secured commitment for complete denuclearization. That's the big thing. They secured the release of three American hostages. They already gave them to us two months ago. These people now living happily back in their homes with their families. And it was pretty rough for them, to put it mildly. Secure the commitment to recover the remains, including these are of fallen heroes. And they're giving a 
commitment. They're starting it immediately to recover the remains. And I just went through how many people asked me about it. I was amazed, actually. So many people would ask me, is it possible? Is it possible? At that time, we had no relationship to Chairman Kim or to anybody else in North Korea. You know, it was a very closed society. Uh, so we're getting the remains back. Secured the halt of all missile and nuclear tests. For how long has it been? Seven months? You haven't had a missile go up. For seven months, you haven't had a nuclear test. You haven't had a nuclear explosion. I remember a nuclear event took place, 8.8 .8 on the Richter scale. And they announced, I heard it on the radio, they announced that a massive, you know, a, a earthquake took place somewhere in Asia. And then they said it was in North Korea, and then they found out it was a nuclear test. I said, I never heard of a Richter scale in the high eights. And if you look, there has been no missile launches. They've blown up their missile area that's going to take place. That has not been written into the contract. We're going to give you the exact details on that. But they secured a halt of all missiles and of all nuclear tests. They secured the closure of their single primary nuclear test flight, test site, all three of them. They're in an area that's common around each other. They secured the closure. They secured the commitment to destroy the Missile engine testing site. That was not in your agreement. I got that after we signed the agreement. I said, do me a favor. You've got this missile engine testing site. We know where it is because of the heat. We, it's incredible, the equipment we have, to be honest with you. I said, can you close it up? You're going to close it up. We maintain the ability to continue to apply sanctions. So we're applying sanctions. Now, I had 300 sanctions that I was getting ready to put on last week. And I said, you know, I can't really put on sanctions when I'm meeting with. I thought it would be very disrespectful. 300 very big ones, powerful ones. And I said it would be disrespectful. So, Jennifer, when you look at all of those things that we got, and when we got our hostages back, I didn't pay $1.8 in cash, like the hostages that came back from Iran, which was a disgraceful situation, what took place. So we've gotten a lot. So when I hear somebody in the media say that President Trump has agreed to meet, like, it's not a big deal to meet. I think we should meet on a lot of different topics, not just this one. And I really believe a lot of great things can happen. Yes, go ahead, please. Sir, um, you, you just listed off a lot of things that you say you got in this meeting. It wasn't too long ago, though, that you said you defined success of this meeting by North Korea giving up its nuclear weapons. Well, that's what they're doing. Well, can you talk about how sure. you... Sure, that's you, what they're doing. Well, I mean, you, I don't think the... the, the, the yeah. uh, Kim Jong-un uh, to, to, for a complete, verifiable, irreversible... Yeah, I, I uh, did, honestly... And can you say why yeah. you didn't secure those details in this agreement? Because there's no time. I, I'm here one day. We're together for many hours intensively, but uh, the process is now going to take place. And I would be surprised, Mike, if they haven't even started already. They have started. They blew up their sites. They blew up their testing site. So, uh, but I will say, uh, he knew prior to coming. You know, this wasn't like a surprise. It wasn't like we've never discussed it. We discussed it. Mike discussed it very, very strongly with his counterpart in North Korea. They knew that this was, let's say they didn't agree to that, I couldn't sign any agreement. There was no agreement that could have been signed. So they understood that. And it wasn't a big point today because really this had been taken care of more than any other thing, because it was all about this. This has been taken care of before we got here. So when we brought that up today, you see the language, it's very strong. It's in the document, yes ma'am. Thank you, Mr. President. Could you talk about the military consequences for North Korea if they don't follow through on the commitments that you're talking about? Well, I don't want to talk. Yeah, I know. That's a tough thing to talk about because I don't want to be threatening. I don't want to be threatening. They understood that. And you've seen what was perhaps going to happen. And you know, Seoul has 28 million people. We think we have big cities. You look at New York where it has 8 million people. We think it's a big city. Seoul has 28 million people, think of that. And it's right next to the border. It's right next to the DMZ. 
It's right there. I mean, if this would have happened, I think, you know, I've heard, oh, 100,000 people. I think you could have lost 20 million people, 30 million people. This is really an honor for me to be doing this because I think, you know, potentially you could have lost, you know, 30, 40, 50 million people. The city of Seoul, one of the biggest cities in the world, is right next to the, the border. You once spoke about fire and fury. Is that no longer the case? Well, at that time we needed perhaps fire and fury because we could not have allowed uh, that kind of capability from the standpoint of the United States. And certainly Japan wasn't going to allow it either. Japan is right next door. One more thing, Mr. President, could you tell us about the video that you showed before this? Yeah. When did you show that to Kim? What was the goal Today. there? Yeah. We had it made up by some I hope you liked it. I thought it was good. I thought it was interesting enough to show. Uh, one in English and one in Korean. And we had it made up. Uh, I showed it to him today, actually during the meeting, toward the end of the meeting. And I think he loved it. He, they were given, we didn't have a big screen like you have the luxury of having. We didn't need it because we had it on a cassette and an iPad. And they played it. And uh, about eight of their representatives were watching it, and I thought they were fascinated by it. I thought it was well done. I showed it to you because that's the future. I mean, that could very well be the future. And the other alternative is just not a very good alternative. It's just not good. But um, I showed it because I really want him to do something. Now, I don't think I had to show it because I really believe he wants to, I think he wants to get it done. Yes, go ahead. How's Staten Island Ferry doing, okay? He wrote the best story about me with the Staten Island Ferry, and after that, he's never written a good story. It's a long time ago, what, sir. I don't know what happened. It's a long time ago. Mr. President, it's been a busy uh, week for you on the international stage. You're leaving this summit here in Singapore, having determined that Kim Jong-un is a talented man. You left the G7 summit a few days ago in Canada, having determined that Prime Minister Trudeau is weak. Uh, and dishonest. What do you say to America's allies who worry that you might be jeopardizing our long-term alliances and who worry that you might be treating our historic friends as enemies and our historic enemies as friends? Well, first of all, I think it's a very fair question. I had a very good meeting with the G7, and I left the meeting, and I'll be honest, uh, we are being taken advantage of by virtually every one of those countries, very, very seriously. Now, the United States, because of bad management at the top, because of presidents that didn't care about trade or didn't understand it or whatever reason, for many years, with China being obviously the most successful at it, but the European Union is second, 151 billion we lost. They were represented at the meeting. And we're being taken advantage of on trade. Canada does have very big advantages over us in terms of trade deficits. We have a big trade deficit with Canada. I was reading where, oh, it's actually a surplus. Not a surplus. It's either 17, but it could actually be 100. You know, they put out a document. I don't know if you saw it. They didn't want me to see it, but we found it. Perhaps they were trying to show the power they have. It's close to $100 billion a year loss with Canada. They don't take our farm products, many of them. Uh, they charge what was 270 percent, but somebody told me the other day that a few months ago they raised it to 295 percent for dairy products. And it's very unfair to our farmers, and it's very unfair to the people of our country, the workers, the farmers, the companies. And we are not able to trade. They have tremendous barriers up. They have tremendous tariffs. So when I put in a countervailing tariff just to get us up a little bit so the balance isn't so much, it's like this. They said, oh, that's so terrible. I said, what's terrible? We have to catch you a little bit. We have to have a little balance. Even if it's not complete, we have to have a little balance. I say this with many countries. Anyway, we, we came, we finished the meeting. Really, everybody was happy. And I agreed to sign something. I asked for changes. I demanded changes. And those changes were made. In fact, the picture with Angela Merkel, who I get along with very well, where I'm sitting there like this, that picture was, we're waiting for the document because I wanted to see the final document as changed by the changes that I requested. That was a very friendly, I know it didn't look friendly and I know it was reported like sort of nasty both ways. I was angry at her or she, actually, we were just talking, the whole group, about something unrelated to everything, very friendly, waiting for the document to come back so I could read it before I leave. Anyway, 
I left and it was very friendly. When I got onto the plane, I think that Justin probably didn't know that Air Force One has about 20 televisions. And I see the television and he's giving a news conference about how he will not be pushed around by the United States. And I say, push him around. We just shook hands. It was very friendly. Look, countries cannot continue to take advantage of us on trade. The numbers are out. Over the last couple of years, and over the last many years, but over the last couple of years, this country has lost $800 billion on trade with other countries, the biggest one being China. $800 billion. $151 billion with the European Union. They don't take our agricultural products, barely. They don't take a lot of what we have, and yet they send Mercedes into us. They send BMWs into us by the millions. It's very unfair. And it's very unfair to our workers, and I'm going to straighten it out, and it won't even be tough. Okay? Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I would like to involve Congress, yes. And no, I have a good relationship with Justin Trudeau. I really did. I, other than he had a news conference that he had because he assumed I was in an airplane and I wasn't watching. He learned that's going to cost a lot of money for the people of Canada. He learned. You can't do that. You can't do that. We left. We had a very good relationship. I've had a good relationship with Justin. I have a good relationship with all. I have a very good relationship with Angela Merkel. but. On NATO, we're paying 4.2 percent. She's paying 1 percent of a much smaller GDP than we have. We're paying 4.2 percent on a much larger. We're paying for, I mean, anyone can say from 60 to 90 percent of NATO. And we're protecting countries of Europe. And then on top of it, they kill us on trade. So we you just can't have it that way. It's unfair to our taxpayers and to our people. But no, I have a good relationship with Justin. And I have, a, I think, a very good relationship with Chairman Kim right now. I really do. I think, uh, I hope it's good, because if it is, we're going to solve a very big problem. I think we've gone a long way to solving it today. Should we keep going for a little while? So I, I don't know. It's up to the legendary Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Should we keep going, Sarah? If, okay, we'll go. Well, I don't care. Hey, you know, it just means we get home a little later in the evening, right? Yeah, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. President. How are you? Uh, I'm nice, good. Nice from the Straits you. Times of Singapore. Welcome to the country. Thank you very I much. I hope you enjoyed our food. Beautiful country, I did. Uh, I just have wanted to find out, you, you describe this as a process. What is the immediate next step? Is there some ongoing dialogue? Yes. With the North oh, we're Korean? getting together next week to go into the details. And that's our Secretary official Pompeo, level. yeah, next week with John Bolton and our entire team to go over the details and to get this stuff done. We want to get it done. He wants to get it done. All We're right. also working very much with South Korea. We're working with Japan. We're working with China to a lesser extent, but we're working with China. And you're uh, coming back to Singapore? I would come back gladly. Uh, your prime minister was fantastic. We were with him yesterday. He's done a great job. It was very welcoming. It really probably had it. It probably made a difference, actually. It's a great place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yes, President. Ma Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what was it about that first interaction with Chairman Kim this morning that dis that made you decide not to walk away after you said that you would know within the first minute if yeah. he was sincere I've about I've said that about relationships. I've said that about people. You know, in the first second, now I was generous, I said five seconds, but you know, in the first second, in some cases, sometimes that doesn't work out. But sometimes it does. Uh, from the beginning, we got along. But there's been a lot of groundwork. This wasn't like we went and we started talking about, as you know, right? We didn't just come in and start talking about these very complex subjects that have been going on for 70 years. Uh, we've been discussing this for months. And, uh, you know, once the rhetoric stopped, once they did a great, a great thing. You know, North Korea did a great thing by going to the Olympics, because the Olympics and President Moon will tell you this. The Olympics was not exactly doing great. People didn't feel like being bombed out of the opening ceremonies. You know, they weren't exactly selling tickets. 
And as soon as, uh, as soon as the chairman, Chairman Kim, said, let's participate in the Olympics, it sold like wildfire and was a great success as an Olympics. It was a great success. He did a great thing. But since that time, pretty much since that time, because as you know, a delegation came from South Korea who had just met with North Korea. They came to the White House. They told me lots of things, including the fact that they'd be willing to denuke. We have one of their great people here today, um, that they were willing to denuke. And once that started, we have, been, we have been really talking about that from the end of the Olympics, when the whole delegation came, to say various things, including denuking. If I may, a second question. Um, in the document that you signed earlier today, North Korea agreed to commit to denuclearization. To borrow a phrase that you have used to criticize um, your predecessors and political opponents, how do you ensure that North Korea is not all talk, no action? Well, going I think, forward? can you ensure anything? Can I ensure that you're going to be able to sit down properly when you sit down? I mean, you can't ensure anything. All I can say is they want to make a deal. That's what I do. My whole life has been deals. I've done great at it. And that's what I do. And I know when somebody wants to deal, and I know when somebody doesn't. A lot of politicians don't. That's not their thing. But it is my thing. I mean, again, uh, this really could have been done, I think, easier a long time ago. But I know for, a f I just feel very strongly, my instinct, my ability or talent, they want to make a deal. And making a deal is a great thing for the world. It's also a great thing for China. Because I can't imagine that China has, you know, is happy with somebody having nuclear weapons so close. So, you know, that's, China was very helpful. So uh, I think he wants to make a deal. Can anybody be certain? But we're going to be certain soon because the negotiations continue. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead. You, you mentioned that uh, you have raised extensively the issue of human rights with Chairman yes. Kim. I wonder what you would say to the group of people who have no ability whatsoever to uh, hear or to see this press conference, the 100,000 North Koreans kept in a network of gulags. Have you betrayed them by legitimizing the regime in Pyongyang? No, I think I've helped them because I think ch things will change. I think I've helped them. There's nothing I can say. Uh, all I can do is do what I can do. We have to stop the nuclearization. We have to do other things, and that's a very important thing. So at a certain point, hopefully, you'll be able to ask me a much more positive question or make a statement. But uh, not much I can do right now. At a certain point, I really believe he's going to uh, do things about it. I think, they, I think they are one of the great winners today, that large group of people that you're talking about. I think, ultimately, they are going to be one of the great winners as a group. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Would you ever consider removing the sanctions without significant improvement in the human rights situation? No, I want significant improvement. I want to know that it won't be happening. And again, once you start that process, there'll be a point at which, even though you won't be finished for a while because it can't happen scientifically or mechanically, but you're not going to be able to go back. You know, once we reach that point, I'll start to give that very serious thought. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You first. Uh, Mr. President, did you also discuss the cost of denuclearization and who's going, how North Korea is about to foot the bill uh, while the crippling sanctions remain in place? I'm from Channel News Asia, Singapore. Well, I think that South Korea and I think that Japan will help them very greatly. I, I think they're prepared to help them. They know they're going to have to help them. I think they're going to help them very greatly. We won't have to help them. The United States has uh, been paying a big price at a lot of different places. but. Uh, South Korea, which obviously is right next door, and Japan, which essentially is next door, uh, they're going to be helping them. And I think they're going to be doing a very generous job and a terrific job. So they will be helping them. And yes, ma'am, go ahead behind. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on Steve's question. Uh, he asked you how long it would take to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. You said a long time. What does that mean? Well, I don't know when you say a long time. I think we will do it as fast as it can be done scientifically, as fast as it can be done mechanically. I don't think, uh, I mean, I've read horror stories. It's a 15-year process, okay? If, assuming you wanted to do it quickly, I don't believe that. I think whoever wrote that is wrong. But there will be a point at which, when you're 20% through, you can't go back. And how long I had an uncle who was a great professor for, I believe, 40 years at MIT. And I used to discuss nuclear with him all the time. 
He was a great expert. He was a great, brilliant genius, Dr. John Trump at MIT. I think he was there 40 years, I was told. In fact, the head of MIT sent me a book on my uncle. And, but we used to talk about nuclear. You're talking about a very complex subject. It's not just like, oh, gee, let's get rid of the nukes. It takes a, it takes a period of time. But the main period of time that I'm talking is that first period. When you, when you hit a certain point, you can't go back. It's very hard to go back. And how long will that take? Oh, we don't know, but it'll go pretty quickly. <laughs> go ahead, sure. Thanks, Mr. President. I wanted to ask again on the sanctions campaign. You, yeah. you alluded at the very beginning that the Chinese are not doing as great a job securing the border as they were before. You expressed you know, some doubts when Kim went to see President Xi. Uh, the Russian foreign minister was in Pyongyang and said there shouldn't be any sanctions while these negotiations are underway. Uh, and the South Koreans are now talking about restoring some form of trade. So with all of those players, appearing to be moving toward uh, eroding sanctions, uh, how can you keep the sanctions regime in place? What leverage do you have on these, company, on these countries? Well, I think we have a lot of leverage. I think we have tremendous leverage. I, I do believe that China, despite my relationship with President Xi, a man who I told you I have great respect for and like also a lot, uh, you know, we're having very tough talks on trade. And I think that probably affects China somewhat, but I have to do what I have to do. And I think over the last two months, the border is more open than it was when we first started. But that is what it is. We have to do it. We had a, we have a tremendous, uh, tremendous deficit in trade, commonly known as a trade deficit. We have a, a tremendous deficit in trade with China. We have to do something about it. We can't continue to let that happen. And I think that has um, had an impact on my relationship in terms of the border. I don't think it has a relationship, you know, I, I don't think it affects my, my feeling or my relationship to President Xi, but uh, when we first started, we weren't ready to go that route. And as we started preparing and, and getting ready to do that, I think that's had an impact on, frankly, the border, I, which is a shame, but I have to do it. I have no choice. For our country, I have to do it. Uh, South Korea will do whatever is necessary to get a deal done. If that means we can't trade, well, they're not going to trade. They're definitely not going to trade. If they think, and they would do this with our concurrence, if they think that they can do some work because we're very far down the line. We're actually very far. You know, that document, when you read it today, that's far down the line. That's not something that just happened to be put together. This was done over months. And again, the rhetoric was important and the sanctions were important. I don't even know which one was more important. They were both important. Yeah, go ahead. Mr. President, David Sanger from the New York Times. Um, I was wondering if you could give us uh, some sense of whether the Chairman Kim told you how many nuclear weapons he believes he's made, whether he's willing to turn those over first, and then whether in your mind you need to do more than was done in the Iran deal for actually dismantling the, uh, both the uranium and the plutonium processes, and whether or not you had a sense that Chairman Kim really understood what that involves and had a timetable in his own mind of shutting that. Well, David, I can tell you he understands. He understands it so well. He understands it better than the people that are doing the work for him. That is an easy one. Uh, as far as what he has, it's substantial, very substantial. Uh, the timing will go quickly. I believe you'll see some good action. I mean, as an example, one of the things with the missile side, I think you're probably surprised to hear that. That was a throw in at the end, the missile side. Uh, but I really believe, David, that it's going to go very quickly. I really believe that it's going to go fast. And it is a very substantial arsenal. There's no question about it. You know, I used to say, Maybe uh, it's all talk and no action. But we have pretty good intelligence into that, although probably less there than any other country. You understand that maybe better than anybody in the room. Probably less there than any other country. But we have enough intelligence to know that what they have is very substantial. This is why, David, I always say that this shouldn't have taken place so late into the process. Wouldn't this have been better if it was five years ago or 20 years ago or 15 years ago and we didn't have to worry about not having a successful meeting like today? So 
And I still love my first interview with you, David. I still have that interview, actually. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Second summit. Uh, that's okay. If there is a second summit with the chairman Kim Jong Un, will it be in Pyongyang or uh, Washington? We haven't set that up. Uh, we'll probably need another summit. We'll probably need or meeting. We can use a different term, but we'll probably need another one. We'll probably. I will say this: we're much further along than I would have thought. I did not think we'd be here. I thought, and I've told people, I didn't want to build up people's hopes too much. I told people, I thought that. This would be a successful meeting if we got along, we developed a relationship, and we could have maybe gotten to this point in three or four months from now. But it really happened very quickly. A lot of that was because of the foundation that was, you know, put down before we met. A lot of things happened very fast. We didn't have, as an example, uh, bringing back the remains. That was not one of the things that was on our agenda today. I brought it up at the very end because so many people had talked to me about it. And I brought it up at the very end, and uh, he was really very gracious. Instead of saying, well, let's talk about it the next time, he said, it makes sense. We will do it. And he knew, you know, they know where many of those incredible people are, where they're buried, along roads, along highways, along paths, usually, because our soldiers were moving back and forth, and they had to move rapidly. It's very sad. But he knew. and and. That was brought up at the very end. And, you know, it's really great that he was able to do it. A lot of people are going to be very happy about that. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Emerald Robinson, One American News. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for the nice way you treat us. We appreciate it. Really, it's very good. It's Thank really you. beautiful what you do. Go ahead. Um, so you And show now I'll probably get this killer question. <laughs> Well, I do want to talk about the future of North yeah, Korea, right. specifically the people. Are, Kim Jong-un is saying he's wanting a brighter future with prosperity for his people, yet we know they've lived under oppression. You showed him this video of what the future could be like, but do you have an idea specifically of the model that he would like to go towards um, economically? Is he open to more economic yeah, freedom? It's a good question. So you saw a tape today and that I think was done really well, but that was done at the highest level of future development. I told him, you may not want this. You may want to do a much smaller version of this. I mean, you're going to do something, but you may want to do a smaller version. You may not want that with the trains and the everything, you know, super, everything the top. And maybe you won't want that. It's going to be up to them. It's going to be up to them. It's going to be up to the people what they want. They may not want that. I can understand that too. But that was a version of what could happen, what could take place. As an example, they have great beaches. You see that whenever they're exploding their cannons into the ocean, right? So I said, boy, look at that. Wouldn't that make a great condo behind? And I explained, I said, you know, instead of doing that, you could have the best hotels in the world right there. Think of it from a real estate perspective. You have South Korea, you have China, and they own the land in the middle. How bad is that, right? It's great. But um, I told them, I said, you may not want to do what's there. You may want to do a smaller version of it or, you know, and that could be. Although I tell you what, he, he looked at that tape. He looked at that iPad and I'm telling you, they, they, they really enjoyed it, I believe, okay? Uh, yeah, go ahead. A Couple of more, okay, we'll do three more. Yeah, go ahead, go. Brian Bennett from Time Magazine. Yes, hi, Brian. Do you Am I on the cover see... again this week? Boy, have I been have so it's many It's entirely covers. possible. Huh? I know. That's Do you okay. now see Kim Jong-un as an equal? In what way? You just showed a, a video that showed you and Kim Jong-un on equal footing in discussing the future of the no, country. No, I think that I think that I don't view it that way. See, I don't view it that way. Uh, I'll do whatever it takes to make the world a safer place. If I have to say I'm sitting on a stage, I mean, I understand what you're getting at. If I have to say I'm sitting on a stage with Chairman Kim, and that's going to get us to save 30 million lives, could be more than that. Uh, I'm willing to sit on the stage. I'm willing to travel to Singapore very proudly, very gladly. Again, I, I you know, other than the fact that it is taking my time, uh, 
they have given up a tremendous amount. They've given it up even before, and, and even add the Olympics to it. You know, you could add the Olympics to the question. They went to the Olympics. They took an Olympics that was going to be a massive failure, that maybe wouldn't have even opened. And they made it a tremendous success by agreeing to participate. Add that to the list of things that they've done. So, Brian, if I can save millions of lives by coming here, sitting down, and establishing a relationship with someone who's a very powerful man, who's got firm control of a country, and that country has very powerful nuclear weapons, it's my honor to do it. Are you concerned that the video you just showed could be used by Kim as propaganda to show him as No, I'm not concerned States? at all. <laughs> we can use that video for other countries. Go ahead. Mr. President, in the year 2000, President Clinton uh, got a request by Kim uh, Jong-il. Got impressed? Got a request oh. from Kim Jong-il to uh, travel to Pyongyang and meet him. And Clinton uh, refused. He sent uh, Secretary of State Albright. Yeah, he did a great deal. And, and he spent $3 billion and got nothing. And they you started are, making nuclear weapons. Mr. President, and you, on the other hand, got the request and uh, right away went uh, here to meet him. And do you understand those people who say that you gave him the ultimate present, a legitimacy to a regime who oppresses its people uh, without an uh, ongoing process before you, as a U.S. president, as uh, the leader of the free world, meet, uh, shake hands with this uh, uh, leader of North Korea who is perceived to be oppressing brutally his own people? Okay, good. I think I've, we just answered yeah, the but question. But do you understand um, I Oh, I understand it much better than you do. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks, Mr. President. Eliana Johnson with sure. Politico. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned a couple specific concessions that you got from Kim, the return of remains and uh, the destruction of the uh, nuclear site. And I know you said that was and an add-on. And much more, and it much more. Than uh, yeah, I know you said the last thing was an add-on, and it wasn't in, in the agreement, but that he gave you his word. If he doesn't follow through on these things, what are you prepared to do in response, and will you lose faith in this process? No, I think he'll do it. I really believe that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this. Uh, I really believe. And it was really the uh, engine testing site, in addition to all of the other things that they've agreed to do. It was the, they have a very powerful engine testing site that, again, we're able to see because of the heat that they, that it emits. And, uh, yeah, I'm able to, uh, I, I'm very happy, I'll tell you what, I'm very happy with those two points, the two points you mentioned, but I think you might be referring to the thing that's not in, which is the engine testing site. I think he's, I think, honestly, I think he's going to do these things. I may be wrong. I mean, I may stand before you in six months and say, hey, I was wrong. I don't know that I'll ever admit that, but I'll find us. <laughs> I'll find some kind of an excuse. Okay, one or two, one more. Come on. But in, in the... It, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, sure. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank Jennifer you. Jennifer Chen with Shenzhen Media Group China. I just Thank would you. like to know, uh, will you uh, call uh, Chinese President Xi when you come back to D.C. Yes. Uh, to discuss about the achievements you made today with uh, yes. Chairman uh, Kim? And uh, I will. What, what's your expectation about China's role to accelerate the... Uh, process to establish the long-term peace mechanism. Well, my expectation yeah. about China is that China is a great country with a great leader and a friend of mine. Uh, and I really believe that he's happy that we've made this kind of progress. And I've heard from him. But I will be calling him very shortly, maybe even before I land. Okay? And, and I have to say, you know, and the United States is a great country. And we have set records economically over $7 trillion in net worth addition to what we have. And we are almost twice the size of the economy of the United States. Nobody talks about this, because you do hear a lot about China, rightfully so. But the United States now is almost twice the size of the economy of China. We have a great country, and we're on a correct path. Okay, one more, that'll be it. Oh, South Korea? Where's South Korea? I think you deserve, go ahead, go. You deserve one, yes. You deserve one. I've got two questions for you, Mr. President. First, you mentioned earlier that you're going to talk with South Korean President Moon Jae-in over the yes. phone. What do you plan to discuss with him? I just want to tell him about the meeting. Very successful, and he'll be very much involved in the final negotiation. Uh, he's a very, very fine gentleman. 
also a friend of mine, and uh, I look forward to speaking to him. He'll be very happy when he hears about I've already sent word to him about what happened. I sent the document to him, actually, and all of the details behind the document. Um, so I'll be talking to him very shortly. If I may ask another question. In signing the peace treaty, uh, do you hope to, do you, do you plan to work this out with North Korea's chairman Kim only, or uh, what do you think about the involvement of uh, South Korea and China as the signatory? I'd like to have them involved also. There's a like question as them, to whether or not we're supposed to or whether or not we legally have to. I don't care. I think it would be great to have China involved and also, of course, South Korea. Okay? Thank you. Uh, Mike, do they have a transcript? They probably have a rough transcript, which you can give us if you have one. Uh, no, they didn't record it. I don't think they recorded it. Are there any recordings of it? I wish there were, because it is interesting stuff. Say it. I, I don't. We probably have some notes or something, but they, they have actually detailed notes, I would imagine. But we... Uh, we had a great we had a great conversation. It was a very heartfelt conversation. You know, I don't have to verify because I have one of the great memories of all time, so I don't have to. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I I don't want to discuss it. But what we did is we've had uh, we've had numerous discussions. Uh, we've had. Uh, very important relationships established at Mike's level and other levels. In fact, a couple of people are here from, as you know, from North Korea. They're in the room. We have a few people in the back also from the room. So when we went into this final agreement, very importantly, we really didn't go in cold. We went in with tremendous relationship and tremendous knowledge. And I think that's why we got it done. So I'm going to head back. I don't know about you folks, but it's been a long time since uh, I've taken it easy, so now we can take it a little bit easy, and then the work begins again. And I appreciate everybody being here. I hope we've answered your questions. And thank you very much. And sort of congratulations to everybody, because this is a really, to me, it's a very important event in world history. And to be really true to myself, I have to add, I want to get it completed. So Mike, our whole team, has to get to work and get it completed, because otherwise, we've done a good job. But if you don't get the ball over the goal line, it doesn't mean enough, okay? So thank you, and sort of congratulations to everybody in the room. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. An upbeat President Trump completing what will his, be his longest uh, prearranged news conference. He's actually only done two, we believe, since he's been in office, but feeling very, very good about his sit-down meeting with Kim Jong-un here in Singapore today. The president appearing to read more into the joint statement they issued than is actually on the paper, there are not a lot of commitments. There's no mention of, uh, of verification and the like. But probably the biggest headline uh, of what we heard, the president saying that uh, he wants to end and will end joint military exercises with South Korea, citing the cost and calling them a provocation, which is interesting because that's the term the North Koreans have typically used. Uh, because they have been outraged over those joint uh, operations. I want to go to Richard Engel right now, who is in Seoul. Richard, you and I both have seen these joint exercises, joint operations in South Korea between U.S. and, and uh, South Korean troops. Uh, do you think this will come as a big shock to the military there? Well, I'm not sure if it's going to be a big shock. One would hope that they have been informed of this ahead of time, uh, but it is a, a massive development. The joint exercises. And here, I'm, I'm in Seoul right now. Twice a year, there are two very large-scale exercises between the U.S. military and the South Korean military. Uh, there are training exercises all the time, but these two big war games. One is primarily a cyber war game where they use computer simulations. And the other is what you would think of as a real war game with bombers coming in and live fire exercises. And every year, the North Koreans protest these. There is a moment of tension. The North Koreans escalate their rhetoric. This, this has been a cycle that has been repeating every single year with the North Koreans demanding that these war games stop. Well, I've spoken to many uh, top U.S. military commanders here in South Korea and asked them, 
well, why don't the war games stop? Uh, you've been doing them for years by now. Clearly, you must know how to conduct these war games. And, and military leaders have consistently told them, uh, told me that they don't just do them for fun, that they are fundamental to the military alliance, that they are essential to making sure that the U.S. military and the South Korean military know how to operate should there ever be a conflict, not just on the Korean Peninsula, but in this region. There is an alliance uh, right now with South Korea, Japan, and uh, the United States. It is fundamental to the United States security in the Pacific, and part of that alliance has been these ongoing war games. So it is a big headline that the U.S. is going to uh, suspend them. All right, Richard Engel, let's go uh, to that news conference where Hallie Jackson, our chief White House correspondent, is. Uh, Hallie, it was notable the transformation the president ma has made in terms of his attitude toward Kim Jong-un. He kept referring to him as uh, yeah. chairman uh, and, and uh, was saying nice things about him in contrast to much of what we heard over the past year. How did that strike you being in the room? Well, we're a long way from Little Rocket Man, Lester. We're a long way from Fire and Fury, which the president was asked about in the room. He appeared at points almost deferential to Kim Jong-un. And you heard that in some of the interactions, including the one where I referenced why he felt comfortable calling Kim a tyrant, a dictator who has starved his people, killed members of his family, why the president felt comfortable calling him talented. And the president said, well, I, he doubled down on it. He said, I do think he's talented. It is an absolute change in tone toward Kim. But the president appears to want, as he made very clear here, a fresh start almost with North Korea. He wants to be able to come to some kind of an agreement. He believes that they will be moving forward. And Lester, I got to tell you, only the second solo news conference this president has held, he did not want to get off that stage. He kept taking questions from reporters even after his staffers were trying to get him out the door and on his way back home. All right, Hallie, thank you very much. Uh, Andrea Mitchell is here. Uh, Andrea, what stood out to you in that very long news conference? Well, certainly his saying that they would be stopping the war games in South Korea. That is essential to deterrence. Uh, Secretary Mattis has said it over and over again. This is going to be a real problem for the Pentagon and uh, certainly for Japan as well, because he even referenced the B-52s from Guam. That's our nuclear umbrella for the region. He took a shot. Uh, also with NATO saying that Germany doesn't spend enough and why are we spending as much money as we are. So he's repeating some of the things he said during the campaign that many had thought he perhaps had learned differently uh, from going but, to these But meetings. Peter, in, in this light, it, it, it sounds like maybe a quid pro quo, but he hasn't explicitly said that was on the table, that, that he offered up an end of the uh, war games. It, it, you know, what struck me just is, is throughout this conversation, perhaps most importantly, what we heard from this president is a willingness to kind of ignore history as it relates to North Korea. He says, I trust my instincts and I do trust this guy. It was remarkable to consider some of the things we heard from the president earlier. He said, among some of the big winners from this one day summit, where the people, the more than 100,000 North Koreans who are in the gulags, the prison camps, the labor camps in that country right now. When asked about the brutal treatment, and he referred to the State of the Union a year ago to North Korea as one of the most brutal regimes in the world. He said today it's a rough situation there, but there are a lot of places that have rough situations. It was kind of remarkable how he was willing to sort of legitimize that, erase it, and say, you know what? We'll just start from scratch. The president will be heading home soon. Uh, Kim Jong Un as well heading heading home soon, ending this summit. But there will be a lot to talk about and to see whether any of this language becomes uh, more codified in a, in a way that will require a timetable, uh, enforcement, verification, etc. So we will see. We'll continue to report this. President Trump, as we said, will depart uh, shortly for the more than 24-hour flight that includes some refueling stops back to Washington where we're told he will arrive sometime around 8 o'clock Wednesday morning. Full details coming up on Today. For now, I'm Lester Holt, NBC News in Singapore.